All right, so we'll be looking at integumentary system this morning. And um, when you look at integumentary system, usually people think of the skin alone. And the reason is this, the skin by itself is also called integument, but not the integumentary system. So skin is usually called integument, all right? So skin is usually called integument, but not the integumentary system. Now, when you think of the integumentary system, you think about any system include more than one organ. The skin is the largest organ in the body. However, it is not a system, it's an organ. So once you see the skin, the skin is only part of a system. However, Skin is also called integument, not integumentary system. All right, so let's go. So here's the skin. So here's the skin and the other organs that makes up the integumentary system. On that, we have the skin, we have some other structures. So glands are part of integumentary system. They hair on your head, on your skin, they are part of the integumentary system. Your nails, they are part of the integumentary system and sensory receptors, all right? So when you look at this, you see the skin there and some other part of the membrane. Let's go. Now, what are the general functions of the skin? The first thing that your skin does is to protect. Now, there was a time an experiment was done using two pigs, very small pigs, that, um, and they were put in an ink solution. In the ink solution, one of the pigs came out uh, blue. It became entirely blue. They washed it off. They couldn't wash off the blue stain from it again because the skin has absorbed the ink solution. Whereas the other, even though it has a ink solution on it, once it was washed off, the skin, the pink skin came back again. Now that shows that one skin was properly formed, the other skin was not properly formed. One skin could serve as an intact barrier that could protect the pig from any form of bacteria invasion. The other skin will easily allow anything to come into. So we say that skin is permeable not selectively permeable, it will permit any anything to enter into the skin. And that will be a dangerous skin. That will be an, a skin that does not protect. It's not a well-formed skin. So your skin does the protection function. The skin, for people that have taken microbiology or that have taken microbiology, your skin is your first, is a major barrier. It's, what, it's one of the first uh, barrier that protects against, a uh, first line of defense that protects you against organisms all right and now what makes the skin to do that now you remember that anatomy determines physiology structure determines function what are the structures on the skin that makes it to perform that function all right now the first is this the skin has a layer on it that is made up of stratified epithelium when we're looking at tissues you remember that i told you how to name tissues how to name tissues based on their structures, based on the shape of the cell, and also the number of layers, all right? So that means that the skin have multiple layers, all right? So there is epidemics on the screen that have multiple layers. And these multiple layers, they help to protect the skin from being washed away. Because once a layer is washed away, another layer in the stratum basal, which we'll be talking about, is going to, seek, is going to differentiate and produce um, more uh, and replace the cells that are washed off. You constantly bathe, you touch, things touch you, your skin cells are washed away, but they are constantly replaced. Now, you have sweat and sebum, which are secreted by the sweat, sweat gland and sebaceous gland. I'll be talking about that in a little bit as well. Now, sweat is as a pH that is not conducive for bacteria to grow. Sebum also creates an environment that makes it uncomfortable 
or bacteria to grow in it. And also that those protect bacteria infection. So bacteria does not stay in your skin. They are only able to penetrate your skin if there's an opening, but they are not going to survive and grow on your skin. Now keratin, again, creates, they are produced by keratinocytes. All right, those are cells in the skin membrane as well. And those create a dry environment, a waterproof environment on the skin that makes it difficult for any organism to stay there as well. And again, this keratin also prevents the skin from drying off, all right? It's like a scale. It's like a scaly appearance on the skin. So that makes it difficult for the skin. It's just like, think about leaves. Our leaves have this transparent thing that you can peel on it, all right? Now, what that does to leaf is to prevent sunlight or sun rays from drying the leaf, all right? So the same thing we have on our skin, it's keratin. It makes our skin to be waterproof, and that also prevents our skin from desiccation, being dried off. All right, melanin. Melanin, they are secreted by melanocyte. And I know you will have heard of melanin and you think of melanin gives people the dark skin appearance. No, yes, it does. But that is not the only function. Now, everyone, regardless of your skin color, con con I mean, have about the same number of melanocytes, which is a cell that secretes melanin. All right. Now, as your cells secrete melanin, the melanin does not just affect your skin color alone. It also protects you from ultraviolet rays. So it prevents, it protects you from ultraviolet rays. And you know what ultraviolet rays can do. It can lead to cancer. It can affect the DNA, affect some cells and lead to uncon uncontrolled cell division. All right. So then the last one is the white blood cell in the dermis also provide immunity to your skin. Now, next is temperature and regulation. Your skin, when we did our homeostasis, I told you that when your skin, when it's cold, what is going to happen? You don't release sweat because your body is going to conserve this, the temperature in your body so that it doesn't go out, all right? And what, how does that happen? It happens through your skin, all right? Sweat, you evaporate, evaporate to cause cooling, but so blood vessels with vessel constriction and vessel dilation. Vessel constriction is what happens when you are not releasing sweat because your blood vessels are constricting. They are not sending blood supply to the skin or to the sweat gland, right? To release sweat. When it's vessel dilation, that's when the hypothalamus say, okay, now we need to release it out. And so it releases blood supply to the sweat gland, then the sweat gland releases sweat out. That is vessel dilation. Now, erect papillae muscle, that is the muscle that is responsible for um, goosebumps. That is what happens. That's the muscle that contracts when the sweat gland should not release sweat, when it's cold. And then you notice that what you see on your body that you cost on your skin that you call goosebumps is simply that that muscle is contracting. Now, please feel free if you have questions, just ask at any point. Now, sensation, you have nerve uh, to sense touch, uh, temperature, and also injury. We'll talk about that more. Excretion is another part. You release sweat. Uh, those are part of excretion. But it's in terms of vitamin D. That helps with absorption of vitamin, of calcium. And we'll talk more about that also in this chapter and the next chapter. Now, when you look at the skin, there are two layers of the skin. There are two layers of the skin. There is the epidermis and there's the dermis. Now, the dermis is the root word. Epi means outside of the dermis, above the dermis, outward, right? Epi, outside. Now, and also there is this layer that we call the subcutaneous layer. Now, the skin is number one, the skin is also called the integument. Then it's also called the cutaneous membrane. Now, so when you say subcutaneous, it means below the skin. Uh, when you say hypodermis, it means below the dermis. Now, so skin is also hypodermis. I mean, subcutaneous membrane is the same thing as the hypodermis, which is what you are seeing here. You see that here? All right. This is hypodermis is the same thing as cutaneous membrane. Very good. So sub means below. 
So IPO also means below, right? So subcutaneous membrane means below the cutaneous membrane. IPO dermis means below the dermis. So it is not part of the skin. It is just a layer below the skin. So usually we couple it together. And the reason is very relevant is because of the function that it performs. When you are getting injection, mostly it goes into the subcutaneous membrane. Why? Because if you look at this area, you see that it is well vascularized. You see a lot of blood vessels there and you see fats there. Adipose tissues are here. This orientation or this structure makes it easy for blood circulation to happen. I mean, for the injection you are putting there to circulate throughout the body because there's blood vessels there, there's adipose tissue there. That makes it easy to circulate the injection throughout the body. And that's why you get it there. All right. So the first layer of the skin is the epidermis. And again, that is what you see on your skin. That is what you see outside. And the second layer is the dermis. All right. Now, if you look at this, this is the epidermis. All right. Here you see the epidermis in this region. And then you see the dermis after. Now, what do you notice? So, Sorry, I think my, let me do my answer again. All right. Now, here you see the dermis, this thickness. You see the dermis around here? That is the dermis. Okay. Then now you have the epidermis here. All of this region will be the epidermis. Then, so all this area, the epidermis. And then here is the hypodermis or subcutaneous membrane. Now, we notice, looking at the epidermis, you will notice that you don't see blood vessels all around here. So how do they get nutrients? How do they survive? They get nutrients by through diffusion from the dermis. All right? So the nutrient they get comes from here. Now, this is what you see in your skin. This is what we call skin, actually. Like when we are saying skin, that is what we see. Now, you will notice that on the epidermis, you will notice you see the hair shaft coming out on the epidermis. However, you see the sweat pores coming out. But the, all of these structures are rooted deep inside. Let's go. Now, <clears throat> What are the cells that are predominant in the epidermis? First, I want you to know the epidermis is simply what you see outside. And if you look at your body, you will notice that there are two types of skin throughout your body. Now, there is a skin that you see in the entire part of your body. And there is another skin that you only see in your palm and at the sole of your foot. Those two skins are different. Your palm and the sole of your foot. You will notice that the skin in your palm and the sole of your foot are actually thicker than the skin you see every, in every other place in your body. You will know they are thicker, and you will know that they also appear to be reddish or pinkish or lighter in coat. Now, why do they appear reddish? Why does it feel like you can see blood uh, transparently on them? is because of the kind of protein that is present there. Now, the skin in the palm of your foot and in your arm, in your, in your, in, on, your, on, on your palm, rather, and also the sole of your foot, we call them the thick skin. We call them thick, as in thick skin. And the one in the other part of your body, we call it thin, tiny, thin skin. And I'll be talking about that now uh, in a bit. Now, you will know that if you look at the skin, there is the epidermis. Now, when we are talking, all we are talking about now is the epidermis. You will notice that there are five layers here. The stratum corneum is a layer. Stratum means layer. Stratum lucidum is another layer. Stratum granulosum is another layer. Stratum spinosum is another layer. And stratum basal is another layer. Those are the five layers of the skin. Now, for the skin that we call the thick skin, the five layers are present. So thick skin have five layers. And if you look at the word thick, it's actually five words as well. 
So thick skin are five layers. And thin skin has four layers because thin is also four words. But which layer is absent in the thin skin that is present in the thick skin, in the thick skin? Thick skin have the layer, thick skin have the layer lucidum. But thick skin, thin skin does not have it. Stratum means layer, yes. And so in thin skin, you don't see stratum lucidum in it. But in thick skin, you have stratum lucidum. Again, thick, five words, five layers. Thin, four words, four letters, four layers. And the layer is in thin skin, you have the corneum, you have the granulosome, you have the spinosome, and you have the basal. All right? Now, so let's look at the cells that are present in each of these layers. We want to look at those cells. All right. So let's look at the cells that makes up the epidermis. And now we are not looking at the entire skin. We're only looking at the top layer of the skin, just the epidermis. Then after that, we're going to go to the dermis and discuss the dermis. Uh, and so that's it. So we are looking at the epidermis now. So think about it. We have the skin. The skin is actually thick because it's made up of two membranes. There is the epidermis and there is the dermis. Now, then on the epidermis, we are looking at the epidermis now. The epidermis can be two different types. You have the thick one on the sole of, on the palm of your hand. Then we have the thin one everywhere in your body. So the thin one is the predominant skin that is everywhere, epidermis. And the thick one is the one that is just in the, in the palm of your hand and the sole of your foot. Now we want to look at the cells in the epidermis. What are the cells that are there? The first cell that are there is the um, keratinocyte. Now, you remember I told you about keratin, and I told you that what keratin does is that it gives your body, your skin, the waterproof environment, more like what you see as scale on leaves, the same thing. And now, the keratinocyte is the one that produces keratin. All right? So keratinocyte produces keratin that we talked about, and the keratin is what helps to protect your skin and underlying tissues from heat. It protects from microorganisms, it protects from chemicals, and also helps to release that sealant on it. Now, what that keratin does is, see, the keratinocyte are produce the... So somehow I think about the keratinocyte as cells that make keratin, and the keratin, I think about it as calcium. Now, on the next chapter, I'll be talking about how calcium, when it's added to cartilage, it will kill the cartilage cells. Think about it as something living, and then you now fill up something with ice. Then it became, or you fill it up with glue. Now, if you put glue on living organisms, what's going to happen? They are going to be adding. That adding will eventually kill the cells. That is the same thing as what keratin does. All right, so keratin is more like calcium in coat. You fill it up with a cell, it's going to kill the cells in coat. All right. So I'm, I'm likening keratin now, like keratinocytes, they are the ones that make keratin. And I'm saying that when keratin fill up cells in coat, they kill the cells. And I link that up to calcium and cartilage, which I'm still going to talk about later. Now, so that's what keratin does, and they are made by the cells keratinocytes. The melanocytes, they are the cells that make melanin. All right? They make the melanin, which I talked about earlier. Now, what you want to take note of is this. So here, in the stratum spinosum, we have keratinocytes. So all these cells here, they are keratinocytes. All right? And here, we have melanocyte here. Melanocyte is in the stratum basal, right? You see that? It's in the stratum basal here. That's where you see melanocyte. 
All right, Langerhans cells are the other cells here, and um, majorly they are derived from the bone marrow, and they are involved in immune response. So these are the cells that help with immunity. So when we're looking at the first, second slide, and we're saying that the cell skin has immune immune function, it is the Langerhans cells that perform those functions in, in skin. Then we have the Markov cells. The Markov cells again. These Markov cells, they are the ones that are responsible for as, as receptors. So that's how you can feel sense of touch. I'll still talk about another part of it, but they are the, the function as receptors and they are responsible for stimulating sensory nerves. So if I touch you now, the reason you know is because of the Markov cells. And you see the Markov cells here, yeah, they are also in the stratum basal. Now, the stratum basal is very rich. I'll be talking about each of the cells later, but it's a very rich cell, richer than other cells. Now, all right, let's go. Now, let's pick the stratum and talk about them one after the other. Again, the skin is made up of, is what we call the epidermis, the hot, the upper, uppermost part of the skin is what we call the epidermis, like you can see here, all right? That is the epidermis. The dermis is thicker than the epidermis. However, there are two types of skin of the epidermis. On the epidermis, we have the thin skin. And I told you that the word thin, the word thin is four layers. It's four words, right? Four words, four layers. All right, so thin skin are four layers, and that's what you see here. And the layer that is absent is the stratum lucidum. And on the other hand, thick skin, five words. Did I say five words? Five letters and five layers. All right, please change this to letters. That's an error. All right, so, and the layer that is absent is, is a stratum lucidum. The lucidum, it's not in the thin skin. I'll show that to you as we go. So, looking at the skin, the utmost, the utmost layer or the uppermost layer of the skin is the stratum conium, and that is what you see here. The stratum conium, that is the uppermost layer of the skin, is the topmost layer. Now, on the stratum conium, you have about fifteen to thirty layers there, so it is quite thick, and that is why you can never wash them away, even when you are bathing, you do things during the day. All of those things wash away skins, I mean cells, but then the cells, uh, the, the hot, the most layer is quite thick. So for both the thin skin and the thick skin, you have the stretch stratum conium there. And again, it is with dry keratinized dead cells. The cells in the topmost layer are not alive, they are dead cells. And I will show you the variation as it goes down the layer. This is the topmost layer. And why? What does it do? We know that keratin is there. If keratin is there, then it's going to prevent again desiccation, dryness. It prevents against penetration of microorganisms. We talk about that. How that sweat gland secretes sweat. How that sebaceous gland secretes sebum, and those makes it uncomfortable for bacteria to grow. Bacteria cannot grow in such dry environment. The keratin gives the skin a dry environment. That dry environment, cells, bacteria cannot grow in it. You will notice that even if your food is dry, bacteria cannot grow on such food. Foods that are dry last longer than foods that are wet. All right, so that's a concept. All right, and that's also why sodium chloride um, 
NACL food, I mean salt, that is how they also protect because they dehydrate the substance. And that's why you also notice that salt is part of the skin, uh, salt is part of the sweat. It's a major part of the sweat that we release. All right, so they provide mechanical protection, obviously 15 to 30 layers, and they also prevent against dryness, all right? Now, the second layer, which is present in both cells, in both skin type, I mean, it is, this is only present in the thick skin. You don't see this in thin skin, only in thick skin, all right? And it's made up of two to three layer cell thick. Now, what is key about this? You know, earlier I told you that the thin skin have, you notice that the thin skin, you see like it has, it is a, a little way pinkish. You will notice that if you press on it, it seems to have more, you see blood in coat circulating as though it is transparent. Why does it have that transparent appearance? It's because it contains a transparent protein and that protein is called elidin. All right, that protein is made up. I mean, the cells there are made up of elidin. So the difference between the anatomy of the corneum and lucidum is simply that the corneum have dry dead keratinocyte, but the lucidum have dead keratinocyte. Yes, but those keratinocytes are filled up with another protein, and that protein is called elidin. It's a transparent protein, which is what makes your skin on the palm of your of your uh, foot and this on the palm of your hand and the sole of your foot to become transparent to have that transparent appearance as though you could see blood vessels you could see blood flow right on dive that is the reason all right again this is only present in thick skin it is not present in your thin skin now the second layer or the third layer is this layer granulosum now you have to know the layers in the order now, the third layer there is the granulosum. See the granulosum? Now, what is key about this granulosum? It is about three to five cells thick as well. Now, they are made up of keratin and keratohyaline. Now, key thing is this. These cells, they have keratinocyte as well. Now, but you will notice that for these cells, they still have the cells are dying but they still have their nucleus and their organelles active so the picture i want you to see here is this think about it that the cells here they are entirely dead no nucleus no, no nucleus no organelles active again the cells here entirely dead no nucleus no no protein nothing active again the only thing is that these cells they have elidin but in the granulosum the cells are dying but the nucleus and the organelle are still active they are beginning to disintegrate but they are still there now let's go to the next one then it will make more sense now if you look at these third cells now to this third layer is a layer spinulosum what is key about it? You see, the cells are alive. Both, they are not growing. They are alive, but they are not growing. Now, let me give you a picture right after I finish talking about the basal. Now, this is where you see the Langan cells that are responsible uh, for immune, immune functions. Uh, so they help, they act as macrophage, they help to phagocytize bacteria or any foreign particles in the cell. Now they are about eight to 10 layers thick. Now look at the stratum layer, the stratum basal. Now the stratum basal is the, is the lowest or the basest layer and it consists of a single layer of cells. Now it's just a single layer, not multiple layer, but what is key about them, those cells are actively dividing. So mitotic activity is as its peak here. Mitotic activity is high among the cells here. 
There are inters passed among inters passed among these cells are melanocytes, which makes melanin, and macaw cells that are responsible for your touch sensation. Now, what is key? Now, let me go through the cycle for you. Look at these cells here. Right now, look at it. In the stratum basal, so I will run through the whole cells using this image. In the stratum basal, the cells in the stratum basal, which are the cells here, the cells in this stratum basal, they are cells that are alive. They are actively dividing. They are very, very active. They are living. These cells in the stratum basal, we call them basal cells. The cells are also called stem cells. Why are they called stem cells? They are the cells that will differentiate later to form the cells that will make up, that will replace the cells in the topmost layers as the cells get washed away. Now, second thing, the stratum um, spinulosum. The stratum spinulosum, they have cells that are still living. So right here, you have cells that are living there. The cells are alive, but they are not growing. So alive, not growing. Take note of that. These cells in basal, they are alive and growing because cell division means growth. The cells in the stratum basal are spinal, spinosome. They are alive, but not dividing. They are not undergoing mitosis. Now, the cells in the uh, granulosome, in the stratum granulosum, which is the stratum here, they are still alive in coat, but they have started to disintegrate. So now, what you have noticed in them is that their nucleus and their organelles have started to disintegrate. Then by the time you get to the lucidum, lucidum, all the cells are dead. Nucleus no longer exist, disintegrate. Organelles disintegrate, they are dead cells. Corneum, again, dead cell. The difference between the cells in lucidum and corneum is that these cells, they are filled with elidin protein. But here, they are dead cells filled with keratin, no elidin protein. And uh, this lucidum, you only see it in thick skin, not in thin skin. Are we clear on it? Do you have any question? question Go ahead, please. Um, so when the cells die are they being like pushed above to the stratus lucidium corneum and surface very good those are that's very thoughtful so you know how if the stratum corneum which is the topmost layer as the cells here are washed away because this is the cell that is in contact with people okay this is the cell that is in contact with your sponge this is in the cell that is in contact with your with your mouse as I'm type, using my mouse now as I'm typing. It is the cells of the stratum corneum that is in contact with everything, right? First is this: the fact that they are dead makes it a protective uh, scheme for us as well. It's part of protection because since the cells are dead, that means they are not going to be alive to allow organism or any other microbial uh, to grow. Uh, to be infected in code, right? Now, how does the cell get replaced? See, this is the answer to the question. When the cells in the dermis, the cell in the corneum are not dividing, so they don't replace themselves. The cells in the strat, in lucidium, they are not dividing, they don't replace themselves. The cells in granulocyte, they are not dividing, they don't replace themselves. The cells in the spinosome, they are not dividing, so they can't replace themselves. All the cells here, they work in layers. So what happened is this, when these cells are going off, when they are washed off, these cells are washed off, how do they get replaced? These cells, the basal cell in the stratum basal is going to differentiate. Now, differentiation in cell means specialization. Don't forget. Now, it's just like this. Let's say, think about this, that all the cells here, they are nurses that just finished nursing school. They just finished nursing school. Everybody are just bedside nurses. Now, if these cells here differentiate, they will form the cells here. So 
now it's like everybody is now having their masters, becoming nurse practitioner. Now we have the ones in gerontology, we have the one in family medicine, we have the one in anesthesia, different nurses now, but they were one all stem cells. They were all the same nurses, bedside nurses. All right, but now they are differentiating, differentiating. Now, then the next layer, if these cells now go again and they differentiate again, and maybe some of them now do acute care again, have double masters, okay, now that's another layer. Then these cells again can decide to say, okay, we are going to do DNP and become doctor of nursing, then okay, that's another layer. Then these cells again can say, we are going to specialize again and become PhD and become this. Now, this is another layer again. Now, how does these cells get replaced? It's simply by the cells in the basal membrane differentiating when it produces, when these cells divide, this is the cell that is dividing. This is a cell that can increase. This is a cell that can multiply. So this cell divide, replace the cells here by differentiating into them. This cell also is going to divide. I mean, it's not dividing. Now, think about it. Let me go down the lane now. These cells here will divide. They are alive. But then they come here. They are still alive, but they have differentiated into cells that are alive, but they are not dif differentiating again. They are not dividing. Then these cells will replace the cells in this layer. These cells here will replace the cell in this layer. These cells will replace the cell in this layer. Now, as they are modifying to different layers, they are losing those function of division. So when the cells in the stratum uh, B cell move to the cells in the stratum spinulosum, they have lost that function because they are specialized into those cells there. So they lose the function of division. When they move into granulosum, they have lost that function because now they will be filled with keratin. When a cell is filled with keratin, that cell cannot be alive again. Does that make sense? So as they move down the layer, they are specializing, specializing to become cells that, move, that can function in that capacity. Any kind of stem cells, not just here, every stem cells are generic cells. They are not specialized. They are like general form, raw material cells. When they differentiate, they limit their functions. Does that make sense? All right. Did I answer your question? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you too. All right. Let's go. So, again, coming here, we now want to talk about the skin, the dermis. So, we look at the epidermis. We look at the dermi, uh, the layers of the skin. We have the corneum. We have the lucidum. We have the granulosome, we have the spinosome, and the basal. So you want to ensure that you know them in the other, just the same way I recited the other now. Now let's look at this dermis. And again, it is this epidermis that is thick or thin skin, what you are seeing outside. The dermis is the same. Now we have two parts of the dermis. We have the dermis that we call the papillary layer, and we have the one that we call the reticular layer. Now, you will notice, even from here, you can tell this is the papillary layer and this is the reticular layer. Looking at this, you can tell that the reticular layer is thicker than the papillary layer. All right, you can tell that the reticular layer is thicker than the papillary layer. Now, that is the damage. Now, the dermis is made up of two layers of connective tissues that compose of interconnected mesh of elastin and collagen fibers. That makes them strong and resilient. The fact that they have this fiber, collagen fiber gives strength. Elastin makes them elastic so the skin can stretch. And that's part of the reason you see the skin wrinkling as we age because the elastin and the collagen fibers lose their uh, strength. Uh, it depreciates, we'll get there. Now, it consists of blood. So here you have blood and you have lymph vessels all over here. And um, you also have the hair follicle. So hair follicle actually is in the, uh, is in the dermis. Sweat gland is in the dermis, but they project into the epidermis. Like now, if you're looking at the hair, the hair follicle itself, the hair roots, all of those originate from the dermis. 
your nails, the roots originate from the dermis. All right, so let's go ahead and look at each of them. Now, papillary layer, which is the smaller layer and the uppermost layer of the dermis. It is made up of areolar connective tissue. So it's a kind of loose connective tissue. And um, is the upper portion of the dermis. It has finger-like projection. This derma papilla, this derma papilla, which is what you see here, that is what is responsible for what we call um, fingerprint. All right. So if you come to the last point here, you see derma papilla reflect on the surface as epidermal ridges. So what we call derma papilla here, it is the one that becomes epidermal ridges here. Now don't forget this is the beginning of the dermis. And here is epidermis, right? Now, so what we call epidermal ridges on the epidermis is actually derma papilla in the dermis. So it's actually called derma papilla in the dermis. Then it reflects as epidermal ridges and fingerprint on the dermis. Think about it this way. You have something inside of you, but when you express it, people see something different. But what you have inside of you is this. So let's say I have this understanding now, but when I'm sharing with people, they really don't understand it. Then it becomes something different when it comes outside. That's the same way it is. In the dermis, we call it derma papilla. But when it comes out, it becomes epidermal ridges on the um, fingerprint outside. All right. Now, you know what is called epidermal ridges? Fingerprint is obviously what we call the fingerprint. But you know there are ridges on your epidermis. That's why you can grab things. You can feel things. Yeah, so those are ridges. Those are ridges on your... Your, your palm is not smooth, right? Those are ridges on it. Now, it also contains capillaries, blood capillaries, like we said. And again, see, it feeds the epidermis. How does it feed the epidermis? Through diffusion. So nutrients here... Capillaries is simply point of the purpose of blood flow is to send nutrients ions to the body. Now, so when you see um, if since the epidermis does not have blood supply, how does it get nutrients? It gets it through diffusion from the dermis. All right, it also contains what we call Mesner corpuscle, corp which is responsible for touch and free nerve endings for sensation of heat, cold, pain, fecal, and hitch. All right, let's go. Now, the reticular portion of the skin, of the dermis, this is not made up of areolar connective tissue. It's made up of dense connective tissue. All right, so we have dense connective tissue here. It's the lower region of the dermis. It's quite larger. Um, it's quite larger than the papillary. It has glands. This is where we have glands. This is where we have the hair follicle. This is where we have fat tissues. All right, now, specific arrangement of the collagen fiber reflects on the surface as cleavage lines. So what you call cleavage, cleavage lines and wrinkle lines, it is coming from the arrangement of collagen fibers on the skin. I mean, in the dermis, in the reticular layer, not the papillary layers now. Now, this is what changes as we age. And now you will notice that in age, people have wrinkled skin more than what we have uh, when we are younger, and the only difference is that the collagen fiber becomes weakened, unlike it is now in us when we are younger. And now this, again, is the one that provides strength and elasticity. Why? How does it provide strength? It has collagen fiber. All right? Now, and that is what changes, that is what regresses as we age, and you will notice that the ten, the the tension on the skin reduces, the strength of the skin reduces, it becomes weakened as though wrinkling as well as we as we hitch. All right. Now they hide. How do we prevent that from happening completely? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no way to prevent that. Yeah, it's just like uh on screen. Sunscreen, okay. Cool. No, I'm talking immortality. <laughs> I don't want no damn sunscreen. That, that's what he's saying. It's not so when obviously sunscreen 
um, like I said, right, we have melanocyte that prevent us, that prevent, uh, that protect us against the impact of sunlight. If we don't have melanocyte, we'll have begun, right? Now, melanocyte, secret melanin that protect us against sunlight, uh, ultraviolet rays. However, we, we, they, it's like your body car. I'll, uh, whatsoever, however you protect the car, you do maintenance, the car is going to wear out over time. There's no way you protect the car, do maintenance, do maintenance. Some things are going to go wrong on the car. Alternator will spoil at some point. Uh, you need to replace uh, the uh, water pump, the fuel pump at some point. You need to re replace your brake pad at some point. You need to replace uh, the brake uh, shoot at some point. So those are things that happen simply because you are driving. Your tires will wear out. There's no way you drive so carefully that you won't need to replace your tire. That's the same way the body is. The body is like a machine. It weakens over time regardless of maintenance. However, maintenance, living well, we increase the duration, right? The durability of, this, of the skin generally. Uh, so that's it. So the, that's the point where skin sunscreen comes into place, we, particularly with this, whether we have in Houston, you want to use sunscreen sometimes when you know, particularly during summer, when you know that it is, it is quite hot. However, uh, in a, on a general terms, there's, it is something that will happen with age. That's why I kept saying with age, not for handling. So that makes sense? So there's, there's no way to immortalize it. All right. Let's go. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, but Charlie, uh, you're lucky we all get to get old. I think it, it, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not that bad. It's not that bad for you. All right. So the the skin now, right under the skin, there's a layer which we talked about earlier. That layer is called the hypodermis or subcutaneous layer. Now, the hypodermis, like I told you, is not actually part of the skin, even though usually people confuse it, but it's not part of the skin. It's just the layer below the skin. Now, I told you earlier that it's made up of fats. So you see fat all over here. So that means it's made up of adipose connective tissues. All right. Fat is not tough. It's not dense. It is loose. So it is loose connective tissue, right? And that is simply a layer that attached to the skin. You see that? It's just below the skin. All right. And I told you it is well vascularized. All right. So you could see blood vessels there. And that's the same reason it is functional with circulating injections. All right. Now, what are the things that affect your skin color? I'll be fast now since I've laid some good foundation uh, and I'll finish soon. What are the things that affect your skin color? Number one, melanin, we've talked about that. Um, melanin, like I said, everyone, have, it is in the stratum basal, right? Melanocyte, you have it in the stratum basal, right? In the stratum basal. And everyone have about the same number of melanocytes. The only difference is in the secretions that is made. The secretion differs in different individual, but the melanocyte is not the issue, is the secretion. Now, what affects the secretion? It is genetics. Our gene affect the secretion. Number two, ultraviolet right rays exposure and hormone. And that's why you notice that there are changes in our skin color even after puberty, as in females. There are changes in our skin color after menopause, as in females, hormone have a lot of impact on our skin. It does not do too much to males because in quote, hormone, testosterone in males is still constantly produced, even though at a lower rate, but it's still not as significantly lower as what happened in females. All right. And ultraviolet rays, you notice that for people that have lived in states like Ohio, in New York, if you live in Houston for another 10 years, you know you will see difference in your skin. 
If you live in Houston for about five years, you see difference in your skin. I've seen people that are saying they don't want to come to Houston because they don't want to become dark. That's that, that's that's what they say. That what that's what I've had people say. Now, so it's simple. I mean, it's, it's the truth. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I'm from New York. Okay, so what have you noticed in your skin color? I'm definitely darker. How long have you been in Houston? About two years, man. And you saw difference already, right? Heck yeah, man. I used to be yeah, like so, this. That's good. So now, even if you use the same cream, you use the same moisturizer, you use the same thing, there's going to be difference because summer is going to heat on you. And when summer heats, it will affect. Now, what happens? Exposure to sunlight. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, is it the sun exposure or the temperature that makes your skin darker? Is it sun exposure? Now, is the melanin secretion is what determines? So, like myself, now I'm dark skin. What that means is that I'm secreting more melanin by genetics. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. My gene controls my body to secrete more melanin. Mm -hmm. Now, but the issue is this. Another thing that also determines the quantity of melanin that your body produces is ultraviolet rays, which is sunlight in this mm -hmm. case now. Now, yeah. so when you are exposed constantly to sunlight, do you know what's going to happen? It's going to trigger your melanocyte to work to mm -hmm. secrete melanin. So now, if you, if you are in an area where there's no too much sunlight, mm -hmm. your melanocyte will not be secreting melanin as much as it as an activator, the activator is sunlight. So once the sunlight, as you are exposed to sunlight, then you are going to be secreting more melanin. More melanin you secrete, the more the, it impacts your screen. Mm -hmm. Now, but don't forget, it also has good value. It also protects you. That melanin also protects you from the impact of the ultraviolet exposure. So like now, you will notice that people that live in areas where they are exposed to ultraviolet rays, they are prone to cancer more than people that live in areas where there's no ultraviolet rays, right? Now, however, melanin secretion also protects you from such impact, all right? So skin color is not just genetics alone. It's genetics with environment, all right? So uh, the environment triggers more melanin secretion. Okay, it so, triggers the cells. So, are you saying that I I am in a bigger like I have a bigger risk of developing skin cancer than you, for example? Is that right? Now, that's a that's what a research says. Uh, I don't know your skin color, but <laughs> I'm Asian. But this is, it. <laughs> but this is it. people who secrete who their genetics secrete more melanin. Mm -hmm. They have, they are built to have more melanin. They are actually, they have more protection mm -hmm. from hot variant rays than people that secrete less melanin. Okay. That, that's, the, that's the science. That's the research. That's what the research says. Okay. Yeah, because the more you have the melanin, the more the protection in coat. So, um, now, but don't forget, don't forget also that Anything whatsoever is a function of environment, lifestyles as well, right? So, like mm -hmm. I was telling some of my students yesterday now, when you were looking, if you are looking at diabetes, for instance, now, uh, even if it's in the family history, your lifestyle also adds to it, right? So, like my mother now, my grandmother had diabetes, but my mother doesn't have, but she has siblings that already had diabetes now. What does that mean? She was at a point, her blood sugar was getting high, then she had to take deliberate measures to ensure she controls her meals. She controls her meals, she controls her intake, sugar intake, control the time she eats, she doesn't eat at night again, all of that. Those lifestyle helps to regulate the him part of the gene of the family history. Does that make sense? Now, so there's a way that, and somebody that doesn't have so like herself, now she's not going to be drinking Coke like someone that doesn't have it in their family history, right? Like myself, now I have to take caution as well and not to be eating things that any other person can eat that does not have it in their family history because my grandparents had diabetes. Now, 
However, if someone exists, it doesn't appear in their family history, but she, the person decides to eat anyhow, eat things without control, all of that, that lifestyle can bring diabetes, even though it's not in the family history. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, so everything is not just genetics, it couples environment, lifestyle with it as well. All right, now the second thing there is carotene. Carotene is a yellow pigment that you see in fruit. Also, you see it in some vegetables. And now that is used to make vitamin A, and that's what gives the encode, the yellow skin color that we have. Now, hemoglobin is what you see in red blood cells. That's what gives the red this color to our skin because of the red uh, color of the blood. Now, here are the skin color clues. Now, when you see a child, like now, all my three babies, when we're born, when they were born, we saw traces of jaundice in them. And how do we know? We notice that you notice that there will be the high will appear white, you see yellow around the nose, around the face will appear yellowish on the skin. That tells you that there's more bilirubin here. Bilirubin is yellow. All right. Now that tells that okay, it looks like there's more bilirubin here. And now we need to attend to it. So that's jaundice. All right. Now, when they say that, oh, this baby is becoming blue, you need to run to emergency. Now, when you notice the baby is becoming blue, that's something you are seeing on the skin. And when the baby is becoming blue, it's because there's oxygen deficiency. Oxygen is not circulating. And that means you tell that on the skin. So skin color cyanosis means there's bluish color uh, around the skin. Now, the other one is Erythemia. Erythemia, erythrocyte is blood, red blood cells, erythrocyte. Uh, now, so when you see erythrocyte, erythemia, so it means redness of the skin due to dilution of blood, capillaries in the dermis. Now, this can be due to, you know, when you say there's inflammation, what do you look out for? For inflammation, you look for redness, you look for the place becomes swollen, uh, there will be pain, and there's temperature. So, is because the blood blood is flowing in that area, the activity of the blood increases the temperature, and that's what you see in erythema. Erythema simply means there is more blood flowing uh, because the skin, the, the blood cells are dilated, and they are, it's um, due to inflammation, infection, or allergy, allergic reaction. Albinism. Now, take note of this particularly. You see people that are albinos. Now, albinism or albino, it's actually, um, now, the cells, they also have melanin. I mean, they have melanocyte, but they don't make melanin. That's the only difference. So someone that is albino now, I am not albino. Someone that is albino is going to have melanocyte like myself. It's going to have white, the, the blood, I mean, the cell, but the person is not going to make melanin, maybe because there's a mutation that happens. So the person is not going to make melanin. So because of that, their skin color, eye color, ear color is going to be like white is because they don't have, they are not going to have any color like either the normal way that the color should be projected <clears throat> because they don't have um, melanin. They don't make melanin. But they have melanocyte. Now, vitiligo. <laughs> vitiligo is the diff is the opposite or the extreme one. Is a case when there is no melanocyte. All right. So it's partial or complete loss of melanocyte. Now, not just melanin. If there is no melanocyte, there can't be melanin. In albinism, no melan no melanin, but there's melanocyte. In vitiligo, there's no melanocyte at all. Now, accessory structures, we'll look at the hair. I'll be moving quite fast now. In the hair, you have uh, ear follicle and you have some glands there. You have the pseudoferous gland, you have the sebaceous gland. Let's go. Now, 
looking at the hair, there is the hair shaft, there's roof, and you have the medulla, cortex, and the cortical. Now, when you look at the hair, you have, I think I will just use this. So you see here, you see the ear bulb here. Here is the hair bulb. You see the hair bulb here? The entire place. Uh, so you see the hair bulb is like the bulb. You see the bulb in quotes. The bulb, how the bulb, the shape of bulb is. You see that shape there? That's the hair bulb. Now, the uh, the papilla is right there. You see the matrix there. But what you I care to tell you more is, you see how the hair root is here? The hair root is in the dermis, not in the epidermis. Now, it is the shaft. You see the shaft? What you see outside that you call your hair is simply the shaft of the hair. The hair is deeply rooted in the dermis. All right? Now, when you see that the hair, all the hair just becomes straight, as in the case of goosebumps, all the hair just becomes straight, that is when the erector pili muscle, which is what you see here, that is when the erector pili muscle, which is what you see here, contracts. When the erector pili muscle contracts, then you see the hair shaft going straight. So it is a contraction of the erector pili muscle that makes your, the strand of your hair, the shaft of your hair, to stand straight and erect. That is the erector pili muscle, which is also uh, seated uh, in the dermis there. All right? So that's the major thing I want you to see there. Now, please just look at um, the face of it. Okay. Now, again, your hair color also depends on the amount of melanin and the type of melanin that we secrete. If it's a lot of melanin, you have dark hair. Different type of melanin, it becomes red and blonde hair. Uh, when the melanin is decreasing, as in age, you see uh, the hair becomes gray. And when the melanin it's now gone because as we grow, melanocyte activity also reduces. And you also know that it's logical. Uh, as we grow, our exposure to sunlight reduces because we go out less. We walk less. So exposure to sunlight reduces. Activity of melanocyte reduces. And so melanin depreciates. I have and a question so, real quick. Go ahead, please. Uh, about sun exposure. So, uh, is it true that uh, it, especially for kids, the more they're exposed to the sun, the more vitamin D they like get? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's it's very correct. However, um, the idea is that they are so in the real sense. So, growing up, they always tell us that money sun. Mm -hmm. Now, but the issue is actually not just morning sun. The reason they talk about morning sun then is because the intensity of sunlight in the morning, it's not that high. So it is something that you can bear and mm -hmm. will not cause damage. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, most, yeah. any, any sun that is not of high intensity, mm -hmm. it activates vitamin D in your system. Okay, um, so it only applies to children, correct? Not just to children, so, it's for everyone. Oh, really? Okay, so this is going to sound stupid, right? But if I am exposed to sun, so that means, again, there is more vitamin D in my system. In quote, yes. However, don't forget, <laughs> you don't want to expose yourself to a sun of 110 to <laughs> get vitamin D. Because the damage that we cause will be more than the vitamin D you are getting. Uh huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That was but it thought. is. I have to add. Exp exp yeah, exposure to sunlight is good mm -hmm. if it is the, if it is not the high intensity sun. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now let me look at the glands real quick. We talked about the glands. Most of them, we've been talking about this, so I'll just quickly move through uh, the glands. Now, sebaceous gland, 
I already told you that sebaceous gland secretes sebum, and that sebum is what helps to give your skin the waterproof as well with keratin and also soften the skin. Now, sebum also creates an environment that is not conducive for bacteria and fungi to grow in your skin. And what you will notice is that sebum becomes okay. What do you call sebum? You know that. Either you use lotions or you don't use lotion. Okay, thank you. It's oil. You will notice that your skin just suddenly becomes oily uh, as you go, particularly when you are exposed to sunlight. You just notice that there's sunlight, there's skin. Now, do you notice such secretions in your palm? Do you notice it in your palm and in your in your foot? In the sole of your foot? No, you don't see that there. So Sebaceous gland is not in those places. They are not in those places, but they are in other parts of the skin. And you will notice if you are if you pay a little attention to your heat, you will notice that you don't notice it until after puberty. Like until at puberty. You don't notice it until at puberty. At the time that a child is still growing, they don't just their face doesn't just become that oily. And if I want to bring it to you now, I will say pimples. So you notice that it's at puberty that you notice that you have pimples that if you if you press on your face you con you you put a little pressure on it it brings that secretion that oily secretion that is what happened but it's usually after puberty it's at puberty all right let's go now hickening is when there is inflammation of the seb of the sebaceous gland all right now pseudoferrous gland pseudoferrous gland they are located in the dermis as well now. That is sweat gland secretes water, salt, urea, lactic acid, and ammonia. And what does it do? It helps to regulate body temperature through evaporation, and it also helps to eliminate waste. Now, sweating is actually very good for our system. Imagine you take sodium, a lot of sodium, you take it in canned food, you take it in uh, when you buy McDonald's, all of those food, fries, they are salt, and they are quite salty. Now, you are taking a lot of sodium into our system. Now, sweating is one of the ways that we release those sodium out. If we don't release it out, that is one of the factors that cause high blood pressure, right? So, you want to reduce the intake of salt. As a matter of fact, I, I, know, I know people that as they grow old, not even as they grow old, I know people that just decide to say, I'm staying off salt. And obviously, as we grow old, we want to reduce the intake of salt, particularly. All right, let's go. Now, air crime sweat gland, apple crime sweat gland. Air crime sweat gland is what you see everywhere in your body. And they are more in the palm and soles. Apple crime are the one you see in the axilla, the pubis, and the areola. Axilla is your armpit. Pubic is uh, where you say the pubic bone region, then hariola, it's the fat area. <clears throat> now, secretive portion is in the dermis with no dots to the surface. This is the hair crime. Now, secretive portion in the dermis and dots open into the surface. Now, what you will notice is that, what you will notice, sorry. <laughs> All right, I saw a question there. Where is areola? Look at it. They are located around the nipple area. So the axilla, you see it around the axilla, the pubic, you see it around the male and reproductive, female reproductive part, then you see the areola around the uh, nipple, the breast region. Now, the, the, uh, these are the, um, the hypocrime, they are secreted after puberty. These, I mean, they are activated at puberty. These are reactivated right at birth. Uh, their secretion is commonly referred to as sweat. That's a crime. Secretion are more viscous. They are have they have distinct odor, and you notice that even in your armpit, right? Uh, which is a axilla. Now, no question. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry for interrupting, right? Don't be sorry. So, it's okay. It's just, uh, act, okay, so a crime sweat glands are active right after birth, right? 
But I read also somewhere that babies, they get heat rash because they can't sweat or their skin just won't like let it out. How does that, can you explain that to me? Please call me again. Okay, so um, equine sweat glands, right? It says they're active right after birth. Mm -hmm. uh, why babies get heat rash? Okay, so heat rash in baby is not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, now, first thing you want to note says is why do baby have uh why do baby heat have um, yes i'm saying that why do you think baby have jaundice because uh they have too much bilirubin and Very they, good. they have to... too much yeah. bilirubin mm -hmm. but you know it's the liver that should break down the bilirubin right mm -hmm. now why is it that they have it now you will notice that one of the things that baby needs to be exposed to sunlight to help them very good very good you know that now they needed to be exposed to more sunlight as a source of vitamin d yeah. as a force of vertical vitamin d now so air crime sweat gland is active in them but the activity just the same way liver also is active in them but the activity is still minimal because they are still in code they are still in the activation process this is uh -huh. these are babies that have been connected they depend all their life on the mother they have the uh, placenta that connect them to the mother and they depend all through their lives. I mean, all through the time of development on that. So the system is active, but the function is still limited. Uh, babies, okay, okay. Yeah, babies have hands, right? They have their low upper limb, they have their lower limbs, but they, they have their skeleton, they have the muscles, but they can't walk yet, mm -hmm. even though they have that. Is it active? Yes but it's, it has limited functions. So mm -hmm. while those happen in the physical structures that we can see, it's also the same thing with the internal structures. Does that make sense? There are some things we don't, you don't give babies, you don't give them salt, you don't give them some food because their system can still not break it down, even though it's active. it's still developing. Yes, even though it's active, right? Yeah. But it's still in the developing state, they are still maturing in code. Uh-huh. Okay, great. Thank you. I always yeah, wanted so, to know that. Yeah. So in the real sense, um, we don't get worried when we see rashes in babies because it's mm -hmm. about normal. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's about normal for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. So this is a uh, cerebrous gland. It secretes cerumen, and cerumen is also a waxy uh liquid um that you see in the hair. Now in the hair, cerumen is not bad. Now, you know you clean the wax in the hair, right? Now, be careful, particularly for kids, we don't need to clean it too much. Once you try to clean a little, it's fine because the cerumen, the wax is there so that it can capture dirt, it can capture dust, it can capture any foreign thing that wants to come into the hair and not let it enter into the hair. So that's the purpose of the cerumen there. It's a waxy liquid that helps to trap dirt, it helps to trap dots, debris that should enter into the hair canal. Now, mammary gland, that is, it's a kind of pseudoferous gland, right? That we said, this is what we said that is it in the uh, areola, right? Area. It's located between the pectoralis major muscle and the skin. It's modified pseudoferous gland, it's secret milk, and that is for nutrition for babies. I'm trying to be fast now. I don't want this to be too long. Now, nails. I would look at the structure of the nails. Then I think I'll be rounding off. All right. Now, look at the nails. Now, when you look at this, this is what you see that we call nails. Here is the nails. That is the nail there. Now, this upper part of the nail. This upper part of the nail is what we call the hyponychium, which is what you, this is what you see. That is what you cut off. That's a lighter part that does not seem to have blood vessel under it that is light. That is what you cut off. That's the hyponychium. You see that is a stratum corneum of the nail, and it's that's what projects over the nail body. 
Now, the entire year, what you see here that is usually pink, that is the nail body itself. So here's the nail body. That pink part is the nail body. Why is it pink? Because under heath, you have uh, blood vessels there. All right? Now, then on the roots, that is the root there that is embedded into the skin. But before that root, you will notice that there's always like a skin here, which is what we call the heponychium. And the whiter region there is what we call nulula. Okay? Now, nail growth, in the, it grows in the nail matrix surrounding the nail root. That's where nail growth happens. So it grows, it grows and projects from here. Let's go. All right, again, different between thick and skin, thin skin. I don't need to go over that again. Just review it since we've talked about it already. Now, injuries, type of injury. There could be superficial and deep wound. Now, deep wounds are simply the ones that goes in. And when we say it's deep, we usually mean that it affects blood vessels, but superficial is just crashes. All right, this is going to bleed because it will cut off the blood vessels as well. Let's go. Now, how does skin use up if it is uh, superficial? It's simply that the cells are in the stratum basal. Now, this will again answer some of the questions I got earlier. Now, you see that the cells when we are talking about how skin is going to heal up, see what the first thing is. It is the cells in the stratum basal that will migrate to replace the cells that has been lost. All right. So the cell will migrate towards the center. So you see the cell in the stratum basal is going to migrate towards the center. And then it will now begin to make new epidemics. It will replace the new tissues and the cells will now become keratinized meaning that keratin will be added to it, and then that will be what will form the skin. It's as simple as that. Anytime there's skin healing, injury, before for the healing to happen, it has to come from the stratum basal cells because stratum basal cells are the cells that can replicate. All right, please read that. Degree bonds, I'll talk about this, then I will let you read the other part. Now, first, de if degree bonds, for the first degree bonds, it means, so degrees are in, bonds are in different degrees, all right? And the impact that bonds, when we have bonds on our body, what it does majorly is dehydration. It's simply dehydration. And then think about it. Why does it lead to dehydration? Because the stratum layer, a corneum that have keratin that is made up of dead cells are affected. So the cell is open. Nothing is, you know, the keratin gives us this scaly appearance that prevents us from dryness. Now, but dehydration can now happen because that stratum corneum is affected already. It's open up. Now, again, the opening will lead to temperature being lower. Then it will affect blood pressure as well because the blood vessels are affected, then it will affect dehydration. Also. If you affect urine as well, dehydration, right? So dehydration is actually the main thing causing the whole of the other thing. Now, so first degree bond, it simply means for the first degree bond, it means the epidermis is damaged. That is the only thing that is happening majorly. First degree bond only have to do with epidermis. So if somebody touch hot plate, for instance, now, touch um, the stove, for instance, that will be first degree bond. It's going to, going to affect the epidemics, all right? Now, the second degree bond, we affect the epidemics and part of the dermis. This will be a major bond. This is not just going to be a slight thing like touching the, hot, uh, the stove. It's touching the stove is just going to be first degree bond because you're just going to touch it and immediately you're going to feel the sensation of pain and you take your hand off. But if it's so if a baby, for instance, now, if a baby is touching something hot or like stove, the baby may not uh, be able to do the normal meal studies, like take the hands off immediately, and that could cause more 
uh, impact. Or let's say second degree burn could be something spilling on someone that will affect some part of the epidemics as well. All right. Now, at that point, the erythemia is going to happen. It's going to form blister. It's going to cause pain, partial loss of skin function, and some scarring. The third degree is when the epidemics, the dermis, and accessory organs are lost. Now, how do we do screen grafts? Screen grafts could happen by just taking some portion of the skin to another area. That would be autograph because it's the same person. Auto, you remember auto truths, feeding yourself. Autograft, grafting yourself. Isograft is when it is similar, like from identical twins. Homograft is when there is temporal. Um, it is a graft from another person. Almost means the same species but different person. Heterograft means different species. Then synthetic means it is synthetic. All right. Let me. Sorry, I need to take it.